Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and I'm privileged to welcome a very, very senior professional from Australia, Mr. Jonathan Wowles. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Jonathan thank is... You, Ashutosh. Thank you. Jonathan is the Operations Director of British American Tobacco, Southeast Asia. And a lot of you who have been, who know me, will may remember that I've spent the first 17 years of my life with India Tobacco. So Jonathan, I'm so delighted to have you on the show. Um, let's talk about supply chains. And you know, the tobacco business is a complex business. Its supply chain is even more complex. But before I start that, over the years, the supply chain function has changed dramatically. When I was uh, mm. a young manager in the early 80s, it used to be, you know, the, the function, function head was a purchase manager. Today, it's a chief supply chain officer. What, according to yeah. you, are the, some of the changes on the evolution of this function? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, similarly to you, I mean, I probably started my journey a bit later than you, but um, yeah, in the early days of my career, supply chain was only just starting to emerge as a, as a dedicated functional area in its own right. Um, you know, terminology like you know, ops or manufacturing or supply chain was sort of used interchangeably to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so in our company, it started off as being you know, operations was the factory and the primary supply chain activities um, but particularly around the planning space, a lot of stuff was uh, sort of done in their own sort of functional areas. So production would do their own planning. Uh, materials were purchased by the purchasing department or the procurement department. Uh, distribution planning around the supply chain was done by logistics teams. Um, and none of that was ever joined up through any sort of system or, mm -hmm. or ways of working. Um, so, yeah, very disjointed. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw the earlier rising or early emerging of what we considered sort of integrated supply chain management or integrated supply chain planning. Mm -hmm. uh, things like Oliver White um, started to build some um, practice around, you know, what does an integrated supply chain look like? And so, you know, we, we started off as being, you know, sort of logistics and, and transport management, adding on the planning activities, integrating procurement up the, up the other end mm -hmm. and the factory being a, a key component in the middle. Um, and that's how it sort of evolved over time. And uh, I think the, the main thing that joined it up was, was the integration through systems uh, and recognising that it was one continuous chain rather than individual departments who didn't necessarily talk to each other as, as openly as they might need to. Mm -hmm. So that's the big change I've seen is, is a very much joined up approach uh, as opposed to you know, factories doing one thing, procurement doing another thing. Uh, logistics and, and planning and, and all doing their own uh, piece underneath so that's the change I've seen it's been um, quite uh, dramatic but uh, I think for the better obviously fascinating and you know uh, for supply chains uh, in the tobacco business um, for a lot of countries that don't grow tobacco mm -hmm. the inward supply chain itself is a complex process and then once the cigarettes are manufactured they are small items but high value what mm. are some of the unique challenges of the cigarette and tobacco business yeah i think for us particularly and as you said high value markets um the issue of uh, security is probably our unique issue mm -hmm. um we've been, to be honest we're not vastly different from a lot of fmcs um you know shelf life yeah, mm -hmm. plenty of other companies have shelf life issues. Correct. Uh, a lot of other companies have high value products. I mean, mm -hmm. some of the electronics, for example, would be uh, easily target items. So, you know, security and that sort of part of the chain. Yeah, we're not, we don't have an, a big cold chain uh, requirement. So mm -hmm. that's not a major challenge for us. So, I mean, yeah, yeah we have some uniqueness um, because of our product, um, but not, not so unique that other, other FMCs couldn't have the same experience. I mean, I'm talking about things like uh, infestation management, for example. It's an agricultural product mm. that attracts uh, insects and beetles and, and the things like a lot of other agricultural products might do as well. So, yeah, pest and hygiene management, security, a little bit of uh, temperature and climatic control. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's not that different, uh, okay. if I'm brutally honest. So there okay. are challenges, but nothing so unique that uh, we can't overcome. Fair enough. 
And, you know, just before we started our conversation, we spoke about the pandemic and that's affected the entire world. Mm. I'd love to get your mm. perspective on what has the pandemic done to your supply chain? Uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> luckily we've been able to sustain our way through it. Um, and one would like to think that was through good management rather than good luck. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, certain things that really help us in this situation have been around you know, product standardization of the products that we sell. <clears throat> we're not we're not McDonald's where a Big Mac is the same everywhere around the world, or almost the same. Um, we have a little bit of a tendency in our industry to tailorize our products a little bit more than we may need to for end markets. And that means that our factories therefore have slight nuances and differences in what we make and specifications and you know, format dimensions and things. Mm-hmm. They have really exposed themselves as being weaknesses in our supply chain. So you know, if we had to shut a factory down and we did have to in a number of cases throughout the world last year and still to this day we have to from time to time, moving production source uh, quickly has been a key uh, need for us that we've not really ever tested for many, many years. Mm. Um, we build contingency plans, we build alternate sources, but mm. hope they never have to be used. Um, what we found is that when you do have to use them, product standardization and machine standardization is very, very key for that. The other one is around looking for you know, multiple sources. So the procurement strategy around having you know, a couple of suppliers, not just for competitive tension, but also for contingency. Mm. And the other one, of course, is uh, local supply bases is, is, is sort of come back into flavor as well. Um, you know, a lot of our supply bases are you know, offshore because of cost and uh, scale. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a tendency to think, rethink some of that and say, mm, maybe we need to bring back some of those critical items closer to the source of, of uh, the customer. So that's been the key learning for us. Absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I've been speaking to several supply chain leaders from around the world. Um, from the origin, early days where it was a purchase manager to today, mm. the supply chain had almost contributing a significant part of the bottom line of the company. Mm. Um, where I've CEOs actually look to the supply chain had to say, how many more points can you add to my bottom line? How does the supply chain head in your business mitigate risk? Um, I guess it's a little bit linked to my previous comments around uh, making sure the supply base is is robust, i.e. that um, there are backups, there are... um, alternate suppliers to go to and Mm -hmm. uh, security is a risk for us as well of course Uh, so you know making sure we work hand in hand with security to make sure that's uh, robust but yeah mainly around ensuring we we consider the the scenarios that may or may not go wrong in our supply chains and have a Mm -hmm. have a plan b or even a plan c and Mm -hmm. as i said the pandemic's really taught us that and that's the key role from a you know supply chain sustainability point of view that we need to keep an eye on for sure okay and uh, a very major component of every supply chain is the warehouse. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm sure you have warehouses uh, for your raw material and finished products. How is technology mm-hmm. changing warehousing? And what do you see as the warehouse of the future? Yeah, good question. I mean, um, yeah, the old warehouse of, of you know, having pallets sitting on the floor and pen and paper to try and record locations mm-hmm. and, and bays and stuff. I mean, that's uh, you know, long gone, hopefully, for most of us. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had the privilege of seeing a number of future warehouses where you know, if space is a constraint, for example, a lot of vertical stacking where you're, you're relying on um, you know, robotic retrieval from uh, bays and uh, the technology to know exactly what's in what bay how long it's been there for, is there a shelf life exposure issue, mm-hmm. um, auto retrieval and put away based on, uh, on picking systems. Yeah, that's not hugely futuristic, but that's mm-hmm. certainly um, improved warehouse operations significantly from a lot of the manual um, labour activities as well as the space uh, constraints that um, we may be facing. Okay. Um, things like, uh, you know, simple things like barcode scanning in and out um, so that you know, data entry and data accuracy is, is, is maintained. Um, you know, if you're transferring from one company system into a warehouse provider system and they, they need to talk to each other, clearly we need interfaces like that. Um, I mean, I think the future will be very much around, you know, you know not necessarily people's warehouses, but warehouses that, um, you know, things get auto scanned in, auto put away, auto picked, auto scanned out, inventory records are accurate. 
um, and and safety and uh, integrity of the product is is obviously uh, top of the the chain as well. So that's the sort of technology changes we've seen, and no doubt other organisations have probably taken it even further than that. Very interesting. And from uh, the supply chain perspective and its use of technology, you know, again, different industries are beginning to do different things. You know, from using artificial intelligence to start talking about what to mm -hmm. order to machine learning, to robotics, to drones. Um, what is your mm -hmm. view on how a lot of this technology, technology is going to impact your supply chains? Do you see, for example, someone delivering a carton of uh, cigarettes by drones to someone's house? <laughs> um, we, we have talked about that sort of stuff. I mean, pizza deliveries and, and that sort of thing's been a bit of a, bit of a, um, a talking point for years around that. I don't think we're there yet. Um, our product you know, is, is very expensive in that respect. And uh, you know, whether we deliver in that sort of format to BC. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you never know. We, we, didn't, uh, we didn't see autonomous cars being on the radar, electric vehicles being on the radar so long ago, and here they are. So you never know. But for us, um, I mean, we start back, I guess, in our factories, mm -hmm. uh, Industry 4.0, really guiding us in that space, the Internet of Things and, and, and uh, devices on the machines for... Mm -hmm. Yeah, tracking our stops, tracking our um, our uh, inventory on the floor, uh, yeah, real time in the system to give us complete visibility of our operations, you know, digital twins and the like, so mm -hmm. that we can you know, see what's happening in our in our supply chain up in the factory space. Then you go up the other end of the chain in the front end, the demand si signal, um, you know, the machine learning that we can put in place mm -hmm. around our demand forecasting systems to try and improve that signal. Mm -hmm. uh, again, have real time visibility of our inventories. Uh, right the way through the chain. And that's, that's where technology is really opening up the, the uh, performance of our supply chains to another level. Um, yeah, things like drones, well, you never know. Um, but yeah, probably the machine learning and AI and, and uh, IoT is certainly um, really working for us mm -hmm. uh, in our factories and in the, in the warehouse space as well. Interesting. So another uh, change that is beginning to happen in the world because of the pandemic is working from home. And mm. uh, you would have seen, you know, as, as most of us as consumers have started to get very spoiled because now we can get our food or our uh, fruits and vegetables delivered in 30 minutes uh, or within a day's mm -hmm. time. From a supply chain perspective, what are your views on how working from home is changing the paradigm. Yeah, I think, um, I guess it's still a bit early to say that it's permanently changed, but I think there's an element of permanency around the, the, mm. uh, the ways of working that we've become accustomed to. So as you said, the expectation that you can order anything online mm. and have it delivered contactless. Mm -hmm. So you know, cash is probably gone mm. um, from a lot of our supply chains. Um, certainly in developed worlds, that's uh, very clear. Um, and, and the speed of the last mile is becoming a much more critical capability for organisations to invest in. Hmm. So where, where consumers used to be you know, capable or, or tolerant of uh, a reasonable lead time for delivery, I think the expectation is, is becoming shorter. So that'll, that'll cause uh, supply chains to invest in that last mile a little bit more so. Um, it may be coming more like a uh, shared uh, you know, courier network, a bit like a, uh, a Grab or a, um, uh, uh, an Uber type style mm -hmm. where you know, freelancing uh, you know, couriers can be very normal in the supply chain as, as, a, as a resource to tap into. Um, and the other thing, of course, is you know, bricks and mortar retail. So you know, do people invest in retail as much as they used to? That's, that's been a trend for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, certainly has taken another step forward in the last, say, 12 months. And therefore, you know, people, the, the act of returning products that didn't meet the, the, the size or the colour or whatever they might have wanted, the ease of return needs to be another capability that we, we transform now uh, and factor that into the, the cost of serving uh, our, our consumers. So, yeah, a lot more B to C. Uh, rather than B2B will be, the, I think, the nature of the game. Uh, the ability to have that last mile speed as well as the returning of products if need be is a capability that's really come on uh, very strong recently, I'm sure. Hmm. Interesting. So one more question related to supply chain, and I'm going to bring this back to 
what happens in India with cigarettes. And I would love to get your perspective. Mm -hmm. A very large amount of the cigarettes sold by the, in, by the small retailers are in individual sticks. You know, where the pack is opened and one, one cigarette mm. is sold to whoever he wants uh, to, uh, you know, who has, whoever wants one cigarette. Uh, what does this do yep. to a supply chain? And is this something that you have seen in other parts of the world in Asia? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's not widely practiced in um, in a lot of our Asian markets. We do have that phenomenon a bit more in the South Pacific markets. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's linked to affordability. Correct. Um, so where there's high excise regimes and uh, customer affordability is an issue, uh, they will purchase single sticks. Uh, it's not our, I guess, preferred option, if you like, mm -hmm. um, from a from a regulations a compliance point of view but it, but it happens and you know philippines is probably in the market that does it the south pacific happens a lot in africa as well mm -hmm. uh, so culturally that's the style you go and buy a single cigarette mm -hmm. uh, and and that's all you you uh, you outlay each time for us it just means that the role of the last vendor in the chain becomes more uh, critical for us so yeah they have a yeah there's a dialogue that happens at you know the vendor's table for example so it's just it's just taking it down to that last vendor who interfaces with the consumer is probably something that we need to focus a bit more on in that situation as opposed to you know, more of the bricks and mortar um, shopkeeper type thing. So the, the, the style of the retail environment um, is therefore sort of commensurate with that style of purchasing across those sort of cultures and communities. That's what we see. Fascinating. So Jonathan, I'm now going to move to uh, the next segment of our conversation which are some questions for you personally. All our young mm. viewers and listeners love to get to know our guests a little more uh, beyond mm -hmm. work. So my first question to you is that in a, in a career which has been so successful, as you look back, what would you say are three key milestones or pivot points in your life or career? Ah, uh, okay. Um... From a real personal point of view, I guess uh, getting married and having children probably would have been one fairly significant uh, sure. uh, milestone or, or a pivot point. And why I say that is obviously uh, when you're managing a career, uh, family is, is a very key uh, factor to consider, True. Um, if you, particularly if you're mobile. Um, so mobility, uh, taking your family to, to far-reaching places is a, is a major consideration. So you know, having, having the family... Um, is, a, is, a, is a significant change in your outlook on, on where you need to be and what you need to be responsible for. So that's one thing, of course. Um, for me personally, uh, one of the big milestones for me that it really took my career in a different direction was um, moving overseas for the first time for a role. Mm -hmm. So I was you know, brought up in Australia, went to school and university in Australia, um, uh, and then started my career in Australia with, with the company. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was offered the opportunity to move, I went to Russia as my first uh, overseas assignment from Australia, which was quite a, quite a significant change in uh, scenery um, for obvious reasons. So that was another clear change for me in terms of expanding my horizons beyond my local context. So that really changed my outlook on not only the company I work for, but also you know, the rest of the, uh, the BAT world and, and, and um, what, what goes on outside. Mm -hmm. That started a bit of a journey in terms of you know, opening opportunities to other overseas assignments until at the moment I'm now back in Australia, uh, back in my home country, but that was a key milestone for sure. Um, and I think the last one would be um, yeah, changing slightly where I spend my time in my career. I started as mainly a supply chain manager in the planning function um, and really taking you know, ownership of the SNOP process and being very familiar with that space. Uh, and then I, um, I went through an, a manufacturing uh, phase where I, I stepped into a manufacturing role, mm -hmm. um, which opened up a whole other dimension again of the, the operations space. So yeah, taking a slight career turn for, for a sort of a ver variety and diversity and experience was another key um, uh, change for me that I, I got a lot from in terms of experience and uh, growth, personal and professional. Fascinating. My next question to you is that as you look back at a career which has been fantastic and as you look ahead, what does success mean to Jonathan? Uh, I think success is a very personal thing. It's not necessarily what, um, what other 
people think of you. It's mm -hmm. uh, what you what goals you set for yourself and you know what you achieve for yourself. So I think success is linked to the goals you set. Uh, and that can be as big or as small as you want it to be. I think a lot of people focus on what other people judge as success uh, and strive for that. Um, and and that, that may be you know, okay for some people, but for me, it means you know, being clear on what your personal goals are, professional goals, um, and, and achieving them you know, one by one or, or over a shorter or a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and when you achieve those goals, that's the feeling of success for me. Whether that impresses other people or not is somewhat irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, or it should be somewhat irrelevant, but that's that's how I picture it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And a follow-up question, uh, you know, for someone who is doing so many interesting things, who or what inspires you? Um, I, I really like uh, working with people who are high energy, but yeah. also very, very uh, visionary, but also very humble at the same time. So mm -hmm. you know, having having working in a culture or an environment where people have a can-do attitude, um, see, you know, have a positive vision of the future, uh, have a growth mindset, um, but come with a humility. And, and that's where that's not always goes hand in hand. So you know, people can be very high dynamic uh, ambition, um, but they may not have the humility to bring the people with them on that journey. And that's something that I really look for in a leader, for, for example, um, someone who can inspire through their visionary pr approach, but also mm -hmm. through their humility. Very interesting. So, uh, Jonathan, I've got time for two more questions. Um, mm -hmm. My next question to you is, what would you say is your leadership style? Um, well, I'd like to think it's a little bit like well, the style I mentioned there before. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure yet. But I mean, what I like to try and do is, is um, it's, it's what we sort of call servant leadership. Mm -hmm. So with the mindset that I take is that, you know, I might have people in my team and rather than thinking that they, they work for me, my leadership style is I'm trying to bias it more towards thinking and, and having the mindset towards I work for them. Okay. So where I can be the most effective and we can get the most, um, you know, best performance is when you play a role as a leader mm -hmm. that seeks the input for people from people mm -hmm. um, and how you can enable them to do their best. Uh, and that's the style I like to try and uh, to work towards. Um, obviously, seniority and experience you know, play a role. And maybe in certain cases, you have to guide people with your experience. But you know, unlocking the potential and capability of the people in your team has proven to me over the years, that's mm -hmm. where you get the best results not by telling people what to do, but by asking them what, what they could do. Wonderful. And that's the difference. It's a, it's a mindset shift I came across a number of years ago um, and realized my role is not to tell uh, people the answer or, or to uh, you know, yell at them about what, how to do it better. It's to unlock their potential. And that's the style I like to try and bring. Wonderful. And my last question to you, and this is for the thousands of young people who will be listening to uh, all that you have said, what would your advice be to a young individual who is starting off on her or his career in the corporate world? Yeah, good one. Um, for me, as I said earlier, one of the things that really opened my eyes up was um, moving outside of two things. One is my sort of sort of comfort zone in terms of functional uh, area of, of expertise. Um, opening up into the manufacturing space when I had been predominantly in a supply chain planning environment um, was a, a bit scary initially, um, going into a role like that at a fairly senior uh, level. Um, how would that uh, work out? But um, expanding my horizons in that respect clearly uh, changed things for me significantly in a positive way. The secondly was the overseas experience. Now, you know, not everyone at the moment has the ability to travel uh, and hopefully that returns, but going overseas and seeing how it's done elsewhere, whether it be a developing market or a developed market, uh, equally you can learn enormous amounts about uh, your particular you know, discipline, whether it be in operations or supply chain or marketing or whatever it might be. Um, but uh, one of the things that I've learned along the way is that uh, you know, our biggest barrier is often self-doubt. So, you know, an obstacle to our own success or obstacle to our own uh, progress or career 
growth is often our own self-doubt about whether we can achieve or not. So having confidence, uh, not unfounded confidence, of course, but having confidence and backing yourself um, to follow through on something is something that I've learned is, is a very powerful internal driver that can help um, you know, surprise yourself sometimes with what mm. you can achieve when, uh, when you, you have the confidence to do it. Very interesting. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and a privilege speaking to you. Thank you for sharing such vast knowledge on supply chains with me and with all our viewers and listeners. And uh, thank you for uh, sharing so many other personal questions. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.